Good evening, everyone. Welcome once again to Prayer Life here at Mount Calvary. We are so thankful for each one of you, our members, our community, and uh, just internationally, because we know that you are uh, everywhere right now watching us tonight. And so we want to thank you for being here. And we know you're going to have a blessing in store for you, and you are going to be inspired and uplifted for the rest of the week. So once again, welcome. We're so glad you're here. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you tonight. Lord, we just want to thank you for all the blessing you bestow upon us, all that you have done for us, and all that you are about to do in our life and through us. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is Father, He's Friend, He's Savior, and He is Lamb. If He did it before, He will do it again. You see, He's the, he's the same God who carved out a path in the ocean who constantly makes ways in impossible situations. He is the God who calmed the storm with the word and healed a leper who was simply reaching out. We serve the same God of Abraham, David, Mary, and Paul, choosing the unqualified, broken people, yet working through them all. You see, we serve a living, active God, an unchanging God, a God who is constantly welcoming the prodigals back home. You see, if he did it before, I'm telling you, he will do it again. If he answered prayers from back then, he will answer prayers now. If he came in power back then, he will come in power now. He is the God who sees and he sees you right now. So when it feels like everything is shaking, I want you to remember he is secure. He is steady. He is unchanging and, and everlasting. He is the same God. Save the date. Mount Calvary SDA Church presents God of a Second Chance Revival from April 20th to April 27th with our very own Dr. Moses Brown as the speaker. One of our musical guests will be the Foster Triplets. So save the date, April 20th through 27th. Welcome to our Wednesday Night Prayer Live. What a program, a service this is going to be tonight. Get ready. We have, I think, one of the most influential speakers in our denomination. He was formerly the Director for Communication for the Southern Union. A good friend, Dr. Stephen Norman. Tonight we'll be dealing from brokenness to blessing. I want you to know God can put you back together again. If you just saw the announcement, Dr. Larry Johnson want to invite all of you to be a part of this revival. It's for the entire church and all your friends and family. On this coming Sabbath, we'll be there bringing the word to you. And throughout the week, we'll be online Sunday through Friday. We'll be off on Thursday. And we'll be back in the sanctuary on the 27th with our special guest live and in person. The Foster Triplets will be with us. We want each of you to go to Mount Calvary website. There you'll find the announcement. You can take that link and send it everywhere of the false to triplets letting we want to pack the house that evening 
at four o'clock. And we want you to join us also for the entire revival. Take the link. This is the time, you know, somebody need to know. And all you have to do, you want to give a Bible study or anything on this coming week, we're going to do all the work for you. All you have to do is invite, invite, invite. Uh, one of our elders, Elder Rain said, invite at least 10 people. We had the prayer line going on 24-7, starting on the 20th. And they'll be praying through the entire week. Oh my goodness, God is going to show up and he's going to show out. It's going to be spectacular seeing the hands of God move in your life. Expect miracles to take place next week. Expect healing to take place next week. Expect God to come in and answer those prayers that have never been answered before. Watch God move. That's why we want everyone on board while this, while this blessing is coming through. Get ready. Get ready. God is about to do something spectacular. We want to make sure you invite somebody to just go to the website and share those invitations to your friends, family, your enemies. We want to see everybody there on, at church on this Sabbath, the 20th. My message this Sabbath will be, and I want you to hear this, my message this Sabbath will be, leave Judas alone. You got to come out and hear what God has given me for that. Leave Judas alone. We're going to be we're going to be pouring out the Holy Spirit on that, that Sabbath. And we're looking for everybody to be a part of that. After this song, I'm going to bring on my guests tonight. From brokenness to, to blessings, this is something going to help each one of you come closer to God. If you're suffering from any kind of loss, anything that's happened in your life, this is going to go very deep. And we have Dr. Stephen Norman with us tonight. So invite someone, share this link with someone, and all those watching on Advent Broadcasting Network and Mount Caver, we are so glad to have you tonight. Right after this music, we'll be right back.
of my soul. Thank you so much. They're from Oakwood University, that beautiful praise team that just love the Lord. Dr. S Pastor Stephen Norman, it's so good to see you, my dear friend. Good evening. Happy to see you. Well, I, I, I was when I was watching that. Uh, I know your your daughter is the first lady there of Oakwood Church. She's married to the pastor there. Yes, we're proud of both of them. Isn't that a blessing? I, I, I was I always know that you have you done it right. Whatever you did, you raised your children right. That's their mother's fault. <laughs> I'll second that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're so glad to have you tonight. And I know you've been through so many different episodes of of grief and situations that some people may have never known or uh, would even believe that ever happened. Uh, you, 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 you have a book out, and I want to start off with that. Can you sh tell us about the book that you have? And we're going to go a little deeper in that. And we have a, a link for people to get the book also. Well, I have a book called Morning Walks. Um, it's M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G-S, -M Morning Walks. And... Um, I, I wrote the book because about two years ago, back in late in 2022, I, we were coming up to Christmas, and I had purchased Christmas cards to send out to people. Mm -hmm. I had all these cards that said Merry Christmas or Happy Holidays. But as I began to address them, I realized that most of the people that I had to send them to would not be having a Merry Christmas or a Happy Christmas because they had experienced losses. And this has been the case all through the pandemic. Not being able to send it out, but wanting to do something to comfort them, I sat down and over the weekend put together a book called Morning Walks. It was a compilation of photographs that I took during my walks in the morning at a local park, just about a mile and a half from me. And then I put with it scriptures and meditations and began to send them out to people. And I, think we, it's, it's, I have it, we gave it out uh, through Advent Health, and they they love it, and it's been a blessing to to many so far. And I, I recommend it very very highly. The pictures are because you're a photographer yourself, and the words were very on point. But through that, you know, I've I've learned that uh, sometimes those monumental occasions come from learning from the tragedies that you had in your life. And there's a few that I want to kind of expound upon. And, and some people had never heard this term before, grieving racially motivated deaths. You know, uh, um, we've seen a lot of atrocities taking place on television, and usually it's somebody else. I was there, uh, in, there in Buffalo when they asked me to come up to do counseling for those family members who had went through the shooting there in the parking lot of the grocery store. And it's different when it happens directly to you. But you 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 went through grieving racially motivated death. Uh tell us a little bit about that. Stephen and Stanley have heard about that and this is something that kind of worked in your own life. Well, 10 months before I was born, my mother had twins. They were named Stephen and Stanley. We were living right there. She and my father were living right there in Tampa, Florida. There used to be a little hospital there right near Mount Calvary called County Home Hospital. She went there 
to deliver the, 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 the twins. And uh, one died shortly after her the birth, and then another one, the other one died later. She heard the nurses talking, and in their conversation, they said, I mean, they, they had charged nurse ask at the time that the shift the shift changed, what happened to that Norman baby? They said it didn't make it. No, it was supposed to make it. It was doing well when I left on the last at the last shift. They said, shh, shh, the mother can hear you. She's right there. The next morning, my wife, my mother asked the doctor, who was a white lady, what happened to my babies? And the lady proceeded to tell her. Well, one died, and the other one we just let die because it's a nigger baby. And you don't need to have any more children. Oh, my mother was devastated, angry. She left, she said that my father said that when she left the hospital, when they rolled her out, she just felt empty, not having anything in her arms. But she was so angry and so determined that I was born 10 months later. <laughs> and, this, at, and I was born in, in, in Clearwater at the Morton Platt mm -hmm. Hospital. But they told me that story and we had so many deaths in our family. You know, I had a great uncle who, who drowned in a boat and they, his brother called for the Coast Guard out off of Miami, and the Coast Guard radioed back, we don't rescue niggas. And so he, he drowned, and we never found him. And so when you grow up hearing these kind of stories, and, and there are many more, a, a number more, uh, it, it, you, you grieve, and it's mixed with an anger. Wow, wow, wow. And you, you also had your your cousin was tied with ropes and, yeah. and bricks yeah. and and dropped in the thrown hot, in the Miami hot River. Car. And and people people don't realize this stuff this stuff just don't go overnight. I mean it's 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 something that sometimes shaped the way you you look at other people. And you had your, your grandfather's best friend. Tell us about that. Your best man. Oh, he was after after he was after the wedding rehearsal. They were he was walking home, and the policeman sh shot him. And after they they shot him, the Episcopalian priest, because my family a lot of them were Episcopalian or Anglican went to the to, to the policeman and because they heard he heard that a white lady had said that the my cousin had stolen the, her purse well the he, the priest said no 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 it can't be not him he's not like that so he persuaded the policeman and the woman to go to the funeral home and to identify him and when she walked they came in they walked in, in there and the lady said, oh, you got the wrong. And as she was saying that, the policeman put his hand over her mouth to cover it up and carry her out. And left it. Yeah. Oh my God. And, and you had to deal with that and, and seeing your family. Yeah, you know, that's why. I believe there's a generation of in our culture who have a lot of these stories even years later and processing it 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 takes something extra to kind of get you through it when you remember that the that it was a, a racial biasness that perpetrated the very acts of those deaths of those that you love and also in 19 2019 uh 
tell us about when you visited the Peace Justice Museum. Well, in in in, Mem in Montgomery, they have the Peace and Justice Museum. I, I call it, and many call it the Lynching Museum. That has monuments to all the people who were lynched back in the days of lynching. Well, and I don't know that lynching is over. It now happens by the police. Uh, George Floyd, that type of thing. I still call it that lynching too. But the I went there because I have one or two cousins. I, well, I thought I had one, but I just found out the other week that I have had that that, that another one of my cousins down in Texas was lynched. And uh, so both of them have monuments in there. I went to, to see one who was killed in Dade County. He was the one who was tied in, tied in, in, in ropes and thrown in, into the Miami River. It's, you know, sometimes we wonder why the old people didn't talk. It's very difficult to talk about these kind of things without it bringing up great emotions. Yes. I've learned how to discuss it and find healing. How to discuss it to help another generation. The Bible says, comfort others with the comfort that you have received. I had to pray and ask God to give me comfort. And when we look to God and find and focus on what he has done, who he is, and what his promise is, what his plan is for justice, that focus can bring a comfort that you cannot find just by keeping quiet. Mm. And as you share it, it reinforces it. And it reinforces the comfort. I like that. I like that. It, and you had to find some type of strategy to cope. And I know a lot, there's a lot of people listening who, who can't feel that type of pain because they never seen that that escalation of, of catastrophe taking place. But there's a whole group that went through the 60s and, and sometimes the 70s and the 50s and, and they 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 remember all these tragedies. You know, having your brother left right here in Tampa at that was a black hospital there and, and they let the baby die because they call him a, a nigger baby. And, uh, having your cousin being roped and, and, and then your grandfather, his friend uh, shot and all these other things just taking place over and over and over. How do you forgive a, a, a race of people that have caused so much agony in your life for a long as a, time as a person and a pastor for a long time i had a very difficult time forgiving in fact i couldn't but two things happened number one a friend of mine who saw my struggle gave me a quotation one day that said from steps to christ that said if we keep uppermost in our mind the unkind and, you know, and I'm just paraphrasing the unjust things that people have done to us. We will never be able to forgive. But if we focus on the goodness and mercy of God to us as individuals, then the love that he has shown us will flow out to others. My father told me something. He said that was also helpful. He says, Steve, Love and treat other people the way God loves and treats you. That helped. And then I attended a forgiveness seminar. And there I learned how to forgive. I didn't want to go. I didn't want to attend it, but I did. 
And in two days, eight hours a day, I sat there and learned the, pra the process of forgiving. And I left there with, with being told that we should teach forgiveness. And I did. I knew I wasn't prepared to teach forgiveness at that point. So I went back and I read seven books on forgiveness from a theological perspective, sociological perspective, and other perspectives, biblical perspective, and so on. But then I needed to experience it myself to know it would work. And so I began the process of actively forgiving. Just this morning, I was talking to a friend whose brother shot her husband. She's angry because her husband is dead. She's angry at her brother for killing her husband. And the people are telling her, you need to forgive, you need to forgive. Um, that's hard. Ought to forgive doesn't help a person forgive. We all know that we ought to. What we need to know is how to. And I learned, God taught me how to. And uh, now I teach it, I share it. And I shared it with her and uh, told her uh, some basic principles that would help her. But I also told her that when in her case, and in many of our cases, such as what I was dealing with, when you, you're dealing with de the, de the anger that comes simply as part of the grief process, but you're also dealing with another anger, a vengeance anger, a vindictive anger against the people who killed the, uh, your relative or your friend. That's two different types of anger. You can't differentiate from between those when you are in, in that process. Therefore, you have to stop back, step back, and then let God through his Holy Spirit help you differentiate and begin, let him begin to forgive through you. I actually had to get to the place where I said, Lord, I can't forgive. Mm. And uh, not until I got there was I able to be helped. Abraham could not have a child until he got to the place that he knew he couldn't. And God cannot help us overcome any sin until we recognize that we cannot do it. It's going to take God to do it. And then the God who stood before Mo Abraham and said, I am El Shaddai, walk before me and be perfect, comes to us and say, I am El Shaddai, I am a God almighty. I will live this life in you that, 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 I'm, that I'm asking you to live so that it is I, no longer you that live, but Christ will live it in you through faith. I love it. I love it. In your forgiveness, when when they I'm, I'm going back to when the, your two brothers the twins one was born still born correct and then the other one that was healthy, no he he, he he neither, neither one was still born okay they were premature and one died i don't know how how, how long he lived maybe a few hours you know but the but neither one of them was still born. And the second was healthy, and it is just a term that they told your mother. They didn't let the baby live. Your brother lived because he was a nigger baby. They said we could have saved it, but we let it sir? go because it was a nigger baby. Yes. Who do you forgive? I mean, do you when when you go back to forgive these people? I mean, do you are you taking in a whole culture, race of people that you just hate all white people? Or is there a segment of people that you you focus on? How do you find the ones to forgive? In that case, I don't. Um, you you forgive the people who okay. I don't know that lady. I never met her. Um, what I had to do was simply commit it to God who judges righteously and then release it. Now, if I had been, now my mother, yeah, she had to forgive. 
and my father had to forgive. Uh, I wasn't born yet. I heard this story. And uh, it, it, I had anger, but I had to commit all of that anger. I had to commit the, the, the event to God. Uh, my grandmother uh, was walking down the road one day, and a white man jumped out of his stop pickup, stopped in uh, his pickup truck, and reached out and jumped over to grab her and pull her into the his pickup truck uh, to abduct her. And uh, you know, she was a little woman, small woman, maybe five feet one. But he realized that he had picked up the he had grabbed the wrong lady. She put a whipping on him. <laughs> <laughs> he jumped back in his truck and ran off. Hey, okay. that happened right down there in West Palm Beach, Miami area. But the though they had to forgive those people, I don't have to forgive people who did not hurt me directly. Now, the there is a cultural uh, forgiveness that we have to give. Sometimes we do. Sometimes have to forgive a culture. A culture, and that's not me to every individual in that culture, but there are cultural sins like the apartheid in Af in, in, South, in South Africa, Jim Crow here in America. We forgive the culture. Sometimes it's the you you you, you see the Supreme Court make a decision that is totally unjust. That's a cultural thing, and you have to, and you forgive, but you don't have to go to each one, each one of those uh, justices and forgive them. Well, then, Falon, you you had like many of us who who are watching. Very few have, in in their older age, have older parents that are still alive. I'm fortunate to have uh, my wife have her mother. Uh, Mother Alma Barzi, who turned 98, and um, what a privilege to have her alive, and I, I think it's a, it's a joy every day. I lost my mother, who you knew, and, and dad, uh, but then a lot of a lot of people have those grieving sessions. Sometimes they can't face Christmas or holidays because of that intimate relationship they had with their parents on those those special times. Uh, tell us about your coping with the deaths of your parents. Well, my mother died in 1998. And um, somebody asked me, what does it feel like to, to lose your mother? The best thing I could say then, and I still say that it felt like a train hit me and I couldn't die. Mm. Um, I cried from a depth that I had never cried before. In fact, it was then that I realized that when a parent loses a child or when a child loses a parent, especially a mother, it's it, it the pain comes near the navel and it's it's like being umbilical they, we were umbilically cut from our parents at birth and it's like being umbilically cut again and um but the way i overcame got through that one was through journaling i got my bible and every morning I would just find scriptures and verses that, well, scriptures and stories in the Bible that showed what God could do and how he cared and his comfort. And I began to journal about those. I remember writing one morning, one that was inspired by it, Humpty Dumpty. Humpty Dumpty fell on the wall, off the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. Humpty Dumpty. Uh, you know, he fell into a lot of, broke into a lot of pieces. However, all the king's men and the king's horses couldn't put him back together again. However, and that's how I felt after the death of my mother. That's how many people this evening are feeling uh, because of the, a, a divorce or a death 
of a spouse or a sister or a brother, they're hurting. They don't know how to put their life, their soul, their spirit back together again. But thank God that even all the king's horses and men could not put it together. God came and put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And he put me back together again. Picked up my heart from out in the street and put me back together and set me back on the wall. And then says, Steve, comfort others with the comfort I just gave you. Tell what them do you who can put their heart together. What do you advocate as some of the rudimentary steps to bouncing back, to getting back together again? Number one, for me, I had to change and look at, you know, one of the questions, things, we have a lot of questions when somebody dies. Why? What? What happened? When will this kind of stuff be over? How? How can I make it? All of these questions are relevant questions, and we feel that if we could just get answers to them, we could make it. That if we just had more information, we could manage. But the answer is not in information. The answer is in Jesus. The only question that I have found that helped me was who. I had to recall who God is. And that was the first step that I had to do. I had to recall who he was and see him as the resurrection and the life. See him as the one who has the keys of hell and of death. Look at what Jesus did, said to Mary and Martha when he met them. And they said, Jesus, if you had been here, my brother had not died. He said, I am the resurrection of life. He told them who he was. <laughs> Jesus comforts people by reminding us who he is. In my book, I tell the story about how after losing four relatives uh, in four months, well, three relatives and a good friend in four months, I was riding my bicycle down uh, uh, one, one February, and it was the trees were dead, the grass was dead, everything was dead. I said, Lord, everything is dead. Death is so wasteful. Struggling to ride. And I was, I loved to ride my bike back in those days. Still do. But I could barely make it. Struggling. When I got to a fork in the in the trail and I wanted to go straight. Uh, but, but I felt impressed to make a left. But if I made a left, I was going to be going west and into the setting sun, and the sun would be in my eyes. I didn't want that. But I just felt strongly impressed. Make a left here. Make a left here. So I made that left. And shortly after I made that left, I approached some dead golden rods that were glistening in the light of the sun. Even though they were dead, they were glistening. And right then, the spirit seemed to say to me, Stephen, even death glistens in the light of Jesus. Mm. You've been struggling because you've been going through this with your back toward me. Wow. Turn and look at death in the light of Jesus. And I prayed, Lord, how do I do that? How do I do that? He says, Look at who I am. I am the one who has the keys of hell and of death. I am the one who I'm Alpha and Omega. I am the one who am I'm the resurrection and the life. As I began to think about Jesus being the resurrection and the life and what that meant for my mother and my uncle and my cousins and my friend, all of a sudden I looked up and I had... And I was riding my bike twice the speed that I was riding it. And when I came, as I finished the trail with no problem, and when I came out, I was running 19 miles an hour. Whereas when I 
was struggling, I was only doing about seven. And I used to laugh about people who could only do seven. Wow. What made the difference? New energy? No. New perspective. When I began to look at who Jesus was, he then, and what, and the fact that he overcame death and he was victory over death, he defeated death, he defeated the grave. He sent his Holy Spirit to comfort me. I have a hope of seeing them again. That, those things about him energized me and gave me the ability. Pastor Norman, I, I, I'm just intrigued with the, the way that you handle such monumental losses and grief. But there, there's, there are those who haven't lost a person, but some have lost, you lost a home, you lost a job. You lost a a, 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 a relation. You got a divorce. Somebody that you thought would be together for the rest of your life, and she done went with somebody else, or he done gone with somebody else, and, and the pain that you're going through, and and the, the loss of those things, just just loss of sometimes just the bodily function that you used to have. I see a lot of patients who can't walk no more. When we come back. Pastor Norman, we want to talk about how you deal with those those everyday losses that take place in your life. We'll be right, right, right back after this announcement from the Foster Triplets. Hello, everyone. We are the Foster Triplets, and it is with great pleasure that we invite you to God of a Second Chance Revival at the Mount Calvary Seventh-day Adventist Church in Tampa, Florida with evangelist Dr. Moses Brown. This happens, ladies and gentlemen, on the 27th of April, so go ahead and mark that down on your calendar. You can join us starting at 11.30 a.m. for worship, and also at 4 o'clock p.m. for our concert. We are looking forward to worshiping with you and praising the Lord together. See you there. Wow, that's why I cherish the blood. It's a blessing to have the Foster Triplets with us on the 27th. So make sure you are tuned in every, every day except Thursday next week for our revival, God of a Second Chance. Pastor Norman. Yes. I, tell us about, you know, some people watching today have lost substantial amounts of money from bad deals or sometimes you have, you co-sign for people, or, uh, uh, people that you trust. And I know some people have lost their homes because they uh, put up the bail money for the child and the child don't come back and just a, a substantial amount of just loss and just trying to forgive those people who who we thought was somebody you're trying to help come out to be hurting you worse how do you cope with these type of losses in your life and, and i know some people who just given up on god because just the lifestyle had to change and, and just all the, the the stuff that comes with losing those things that close to you. How do you cope? Tell us about it. Well, we can lose a house. We can lose a car. We can lose friends. We can lose money. Maybe the most profound loss that I know I'm aware of is the loss of trust. Mm. when you've trusted somebody or put your trust in in an organization or something and that that trust is betrayed and you lose it uh that's a very difficult to we to come back after many types of loss however whatever our loss I don't have but one 
way to deal with my losses, and that is go back to him. Paul said, I mean, Peter said, if we, Lord, if you leave, where do we go? Where do we go? Whatever my loss is, I go to God and I begin to talk to him. Yes. And I go to the Bible and let him begin to talk to me in the Bible. He not, he doesn't talk to us in our in our head. He doesn't, he's not gonna just speak some words. You have to go to the Bible. And there, as you take the word and pray, day after day, it's been my experience that I'm going to see something. Now I also need to tell you this. February 24, 1974, I began to journal. My journal is not what happened in the day, who who I saw, all that. That's not that's immaterial to me. It's important. I appreciate people and that and the things that happen. But what's most important, primary importance to me is what God has been talking to me about in my devotion. So every day from, from 19 February 24, 1974 until now, more than 50 years, it was 50 years this past February, I have been journaling about what God and I talk about in the mornings. I like that. The insights that he's given me, the encouragement that he's given me, the knowledge that he's given me. The, the See, when I'm in the Bible, he's helping me know him. Mm. Second Peter says, everything that we need for life and for godliness, we receive through our knowledge of him. Yes. So everything that I need to deal with grief, everything that I need to deal with loss, everything that I need to have a godly life comes through knowing him. Yes, I like that. And as I know him, he then through his great and precious promises gives me everything I need so I become a partaker of the divine nature. Mm. That's 2 Peter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, you know, and so on. But what I have found from my journal is any time that I go through a crisis, if I go back through my journal, I will see that some at some point within the last three to four months, God had shown me everything that I needed to help me in that crisis. Come on now. When my brother-in-law died, James Humphrey, Massive heart attack, 19, it, it, when he was 48 years old, I went back in my journal and God had shown me. When my father died uh, in 2017, I looked back in my journal and I saw where Moses at Mount Sinai pressed into the dark. The people mm. moved back from Mount Sinai, but he pressed into the dark. And God said, Steve, don't run. Don't, there's a temptation to run from the darkness of death, but press in and I will let you see me just like Moses saw me when and came into toward with me where, where I sense my presence. I'm not going to let you see my face, but you will come and have an experience with me there in your dark time. God has never failed that kind of thing. He always before my mother died. Somebody sent me a verse, a translation of Romans 8.28 that I'd never understood before. It says everything that life sent, it, all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. I never understood that. But just before she died, somebody sent me a version of that that I've never been able to find since then. But it says everything that life sends is not good. But whether it be good or whether it be evil, God will take it and make it work for good to them that love the Lord. Hey. Friends, somebody listening to me has lost a house. Somebody has lost some money. Somebody has lost a job. God is able to take that and make it work for good for you. Stop, sit down with him and let him show you how he's going to work it out. Was it easier when your father died? Your father was one of the uh, prestigious teachers there at Oakwood University before he died. Doctors. Stephen Norman, um, and he was in the biology science department. Business. The business department. 
and he he taught a lot of kids throughout many years. I don't know how many years he was there. But after you've been through, does it get easier the further you go down or do the, the pain hurts just as much when you lose somebody else that close? I think the I think the pain is going to be different each time. The pain is going to I don't know that it gets any easier. However, what happened is this. When my mother died, that was the first close death that I had ever experienced. All right, it hit me really hard. But then when my four, my three, my uncle and cousins died, I could draw back from what I had gained from my mother. Yeah. But then when, I mean, 2005, my my wife lost seven relatives in one year, including her father and her brother. But and then and I call we I was calling that the year from hell. And as but as we were driving back from her father's funeral, I decided to call my cousin. And she says, Steve, you must have heard about the plane crash. I said, no, what her plane crash? She says, a plane crash, and we got a cousin on it. But come to find out that nine of our cousins had died in one plane crash. Mm, mm, it was hard, very hard. But the, ex the, the experience that I had with God on my bicycle when he said, Steve, look at death in the light of Jesus, came yeah. back to me. And I handle the nine as well as I handle better than I handle the four because I knew to keep my eyes on him. I like to, sometimes I tell people, let's play a game. And they said, what, what, what kind of game? I said, God is. They said, how do you play that? I says, we just say God is and you finish it. And so I say, God, I say, I'll get it started. God is love. And they will answer it back with maybe God is good. And we go back and forth like that, back and forth like that. And pretty soon, focus in on who God is and what he is like. And how then they recall who God is. And they and we end up saying, great is our faithfulness. All that I've needed, thy hands have provided. Lamentations. Oh, I love that. I'm going to start doing that. God is. Yeah, everything, <laughs> Pastor Norman. Before we, it's been just a pleasure. But I want to hit this portion of before we close out. Uh, we have something at Mount Calvary called Church Hurt, and uh, Dr. David Spence been instrumental in working with that, and also our women's leader director, uh, Sister Carol Johnson. That's the first lady, the beautiful first lady of our church. Uh, she's been working on, you know, making these these avenues, these safe places where we can come back together and, and heal. Uh, coping with political attacks in the church. Uh, there's a lot of undermining things that the young people see and they know it's not right. And they're hurt sometimes by the actions of leaders in our church are, are, are those who have those positions, and we, especially when we come down to the nominating committees. And some people have not come back to church because of these things. But coping with political attacks in the church, what is your direction in healing through this? Number one, we know where it's coming from. Satan is behind it. An enemy has done this, Jesus says. The enemy, Satan, came into the garden and created hurt there in Eve's heart. He made her feel hurt by God. He's not letting you have everything. And he constantly causes us to feel hurt in the environments where we are most likely to be able to get some help. He lets you get hurt in church because church is where you get your salvation, where you can get your hope. Yes. And so by letting you get hurt in church, he can close the door to the help. 
Oh my. Know who the enemy is. It's not the person there at the church. It's not the leaders in the church. Yeah, they may treat you bad. They may You may get hurt in some experiences. But ask God. I've been hurt. I've been hurt. I've been hurt, I've been hurt in church. I've been hurt with conference stuff. But what I have found out is there, is this. Number one. Take it to the Lord in prayer and leave it there. Commit it to him. Let Jesus fix it for you. Number two, stay close to God. My wife and I had an experience when we, early years of our marriage, somebody tried to come between us and break us up. And we were walking one Sabbath hand in hand. And I said, you know what? We may, we may face attacks. But just like we're holding hands right now, whatever comes, we're going to hold hands tighter. The knot that, that tied us in marriage is going to get tighter. <laughs> whatever pulls at us is going to make us tighter. And, what, and we, are, we are Christ's bride. Whatever happens in church, whatever happens in the conference, let's stay close to God. And let and have a tight relationship with him. And when we do that, he helps us overcome. Let's and Ella White says this when you meet, meet, meet with hurt in, in churches and these kind of places, she says, go back and study the story of Joseph, Daniel, and Jesus. Jesus experienced the worst church hurt there is. Yes, yes, yes. But, he still loved. Ellen White experienced it. And she forgave. Friends, let nothing come between us and God. Between you and God. And that's the that's the big key. It's gonna hurt. I've had hurts from church people. I told I told them, I told my daughter one day it felt like a mule that kicked me in the stomach. <laughs> but when I went to the Lord, he said the same thing he said to, to uh, Job. He says, stand up like a man. I, I said this way. God looked at me and said, buck up, Steve. Buck up. Buck up, Steve. I like that. I like you know, that. In other words, buck up. Look to me. Buck up. Stand up. Be a man. Be a woman. Don't have thick, thin skin. And go back and face it. Forgive it. Forgive what had happened. And then move on because you don't, Satan wants you to get hurt so he can separate you from God. Every time he can, see, this we, this week, this whole quarter, we're studying the great controversy. And it's all about God and his people and Satan trying to take as many of God's people away as possible. And if he can get that to happen in church, and separate you from the, the from the from the from the body of Christ that God asks people to ask people to as to be saved. He says he asks to add to the church daily, such such as should be saved. If he adding you to the church so you can be saved, don't let Satan do anything to take you out of it. Pastor Norman, thank you so much for your words of wisdom. You've been a plum pleasing pleasure. Having you with us tonight. Plum Make sure y'all download the book. Pleasure. Uh, that's a good one. <laughs> Make sure y'all download the book. Uh, order the book. Use it for your church. Get it out to wherever you are. You go to that website right there. G-E-S-S-Book.com. You can get that book. Please order it. Don't just get one. Get He can get packages of it. And make sure that everyone in your church those that are going through your grief committee, they have those books. Pastor Norman, before we close out, could we have about 60 seconds left. Could you just give us a prayer for those who who are in recovery, who are in the recovery room? Heavenly Father, there are times in life that are hard, but we're thankful that you know what hard is. You allow your son to experience pain. You experienced the death of your son. Jesus experienced the death of his father. You said, precious in the sight of the Lord, 
of the is the death of the the death of the saints, which means it's costly to you. Every time somebody dies, it hurts you deeply. You feel it at a very deep level. That's what that means. And Lord, because you feel it so deeply, you know. Now I ask that you would give comfort to every person who's listening this evening. Send your Holy Spirit the comforter and help them in your word to see you, in nature to see you as you let me see you in nature. And then help them to turn around and help somebody else with the comfort you gave them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you think God is mad at you, God is not mad at you. God is madly in love with you. Until we meet again, may God bless you and keep you. We'll see you Sabbath. God bless.